How are y'all? Yeah. <laughs> I think everyone in here is either a tutor or mine or actually in my class. So that's cool. At least y'all came. Um, hi, I'm Matt Latimer. And this is Cynthia LaFosso. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is MLA format and APA format. Okay, and so formatting can be a major pain, as you guys know, for students. MLA, um, what I'm going to focus on, Cynthia is going to talk first. The two main things I'm going to focus on will be the changes in MLA format. And I'll also talk a bit about plagiarism. Uh, since we're talking about citations, plagiarism goes hand in hand with that. So there's a bunch of handouts up here. And I think you may have been able to do your job. I did. So since I'm going to talk first, yeah. you can look at that one. And yep. And I, was, I was very lazy, so I didn't hand mine out. You guys will have to come get it. After she's done. So, all right. Cynthia, we'll, we'll talk to you guys about APA first. All right, well, so I'm Cynthia LaFazzo. I'm a psychology professor here, and I know that this was advertised as an MLA formatting workshop, but we decided to add APA in. And um, so here, here's, the, here's the interesting news about APA. You're learning all sorts of, um, F, of, you're learning all about MLA formatting in your English classes, and you've probably been doing a lot of MLA formatting in all of your English classes in the past, right? Well, guess what? Outside of English, you won't do MLA formatting. You'll be doing APA formatting. So any of your science classes, your social science classes, um, anything that's related to the medical field, all of that is APA formatting. Uh, so it's really important that you have some familiarity with this as well. Um, the thing about formatting, and so like you know, Matt said, it, it's a bit of a pain. Right? It's like it's really focusing on these nitty-gritty details, having proper indents, indentations, and you probably are asking this question: Why do we have to do it this way? We don't make the rules. These rules are established by a governing body that is at a national level, and the reason why the rules are there are for publishing consistency. It's really nothing more than that. And so, what you're learning right now is. Um, is something that would apply to that applies to a publishing um, level and it also applies to when you're looking at research so you know if everything is published consistently the referencing the in-text citations are all exactly in the same format you know exactly what to go and look for and exactly what it means if we didn't have these publishing guidelines then it would just be random and the, and the publishing would be meaningless. So it's really not to punish you. It's really not to punish me. It's not to punish anybody. I know it feels like punishment when you're sitting and you're trying to get your computer to indent, you know, five on the second line, and you're dealing with all these goofy formatting issues. But it really is for consistency within the discipline. And when you start looking at journals uh, for research papers, you will see everything is formatted exactly the same way. So everybody learns to do this. What I've handed you today, and I'm not going to go through this, this is something you can use entirely on your own. Um, this is a cheat sheet that I came across looking for some resources so that we wouldn't have to look at the manual, which is um, about a few years old now. We're in sixth edition for um, APA format. And the manual is about yay thick, right? Yeah. And so who wants to go through that, especially if you know you're, uh, you're really going to be focusing on uh, journal articles, websites, uh, maybe a book or two. It's all in here. How to do exactly what that uh, format, what that uh, citation format should look like. So a couple of key differences. One thing, MLA, which has some new formatting requirements, your in-text citations are different. And I find that students get very confused on this. You're so used to uh, working in MLA, this is what you were taught in high school, and then I ask you, or another teacher asks you to do something in APA, and you automatically shift back to that MLA formatting. I see this happening over and over and over again. It's not complicated, you just have to know what you're doing. For an in-text citation for APA, it is the author's last name, 
in parentheses, author's last name, comma, year of publication, close parentheses. That's it. It's not complicated, but that's what you need to do. MLA requires page numbers, I believe, right? Page numbers sort of consistently. The only reason, the only reason you use a page number in APA formatting is when you have a direct quote. And there's a very specific way of doing that. So for the majority of the work that you do with paraphrasing and summarizing information, your in-text citations, author last name, comma, year of publication. And that's in parentheses. Sometimes that goes in, well, that's how it would look like at the end of a, end of a sentence. Um, there are other ways of doing it depending on your writing style. And your, your tutor could work with you on that as well. For your reference page, there's also some key nitpicky differences. The title of the reference page in MLA format is Works cited. Right? That's what you've been doing all these years. Works cited. Not so in APA formatting. It is called references. Your title needs to state references, not works cited. And you might think this is just being silly or being nitpicky, but again, it is simply for consistency within the discipline. Okay? Um, this handout here, it gives you exactly the formatting that you need for journal articles. If you're looking at peer-reviewed journal articles for a research paper, if you're looking at websites, uh, if you're using a book, there are different, different formats for each of those. And uh, I would strongly encourage you to learn how to type these in manually. I know that there are little I know that Microsoft Word has something that you can put information in, and I know that there are also some online like gadgets you can put the information in and it will plug in your reference. How many of you have used that in the past for MLA formatting? And how many of you have gotten things wrong by using that? Have you ever had problems? Yeah. So here's the thing, is that it's only, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It's only as good as the information you put in. Right? It's not a magic worker. Um, so um, I, I think it's a good idea to learn how to do these by hand, just so you know how they work, to make sure you understand exactly what's going into that reference. They're not hard to do. You simply duplicate what you see here. You take the information from your source, and you plug it in. Okay? If you decide to use one of those online gadgets, or you use Microsoft Word, when you, when you finish your reference, compare it to this. Make sure that it matches. If it doesn't match, then the information that you put in was inaccurate. And then you need, you'll need to you know, work with it and then redo it. Okay? Matt's going to talk about plagiarism, so uh, I'm not going to, I don't want to uh, go over that, but except to, except to stress that it is an incredibly important topic, and it is a confusing topic for a lot of students. Uh, I have a uh, resource that I use in my classes, which is a little plagiarism tutorial. and has a little pre-test and post-test. It's very short, but it's very useful. If anybody is interested in that, uh, you can let us know, and I'll, I'll actually make that available with our tutors as well, and I can pass that on. I make all my students have to read that so they get a little more familiarity with actually reading and looking at the differences between something that is and is not plagiarized. Because uh, I understand this can be confusing sometimes. Paraphrasing especially can be very confusing. Can I answer any questions about APA formatting? Question. Yes. If there is any information that's missing, for example, if an author's name, anything like that, or maybe you can't find a date is that information just excluded or do you need to indicate there was no date or something? You do need to indicate. So if there is no date, there is a way to indicate that with the parentheses in its lowercase n period, d period. Um, and I do find that students have a tendency to automatically assume there's no date. Uh, usually there is a date, um, especially if you're taking it, if this is going to come from a library resource, there's a date, you just have to find it. 
Websites can be a little trickier, um, and there are there are there are specific ways to to, to reference websites. But if there is no date, uh, there is a way to do that. If it is say an article that comes from the National Institute of Health, and there's no author, there is a way to um, reference that as well. And I think there's an example of that in here. So if you have an organization rather than an author, it, it tells you exactly how how to do that. I don't, I don't want to read seven pages of APA formatting to you then. Um, if there's not something, if, if you don't find it in here, there are several resources online uh, that are very useful. One, the, the most useful one I find is, and I'm sure some of you have used this, is the Online Writing Lab, the OWL at Purdue. How many of you have used that before? Yeah, uh, so OWL at Purdue is fabulous. Um, it's a little tricky with the APA portion of it because they haven't, there is an area where you have to click on that says sixth edition. Have you seen that? You have to, you have to scroll to the bottom and it says change, sixth edition changes. So for some reason they haven't just incorporated those changes into the website. Uh, and so I, I find a lot of students end up doing fifth edition and because that is confusing, I'll accept it. And as long as it's close, I'll take it. Uh, but anyway, that's a, that's a really good website. So if you can't find it here on this cheat sheet, uh, the Owl at Purdue has everything. Oh, the other thing that I, I thought I would mention, uh, so there is something, when you talk about formatting for APA, it's not just reference style, it's not just in-text citations in your reference page. It is the actual structure of your paper. And the Owl at Purdue will give you an example of what a standard research paper looks like in APA format. And it goes through these sections where you have your abstract, you have your uh, introduction, you have your methods, and, you know, and your discussion, and so on and so forth. The majority of the papers that you would do here are not, do not require those that break down. You're not doing original studies. You don't have an abstract. You don't have data that you're collecting. You don't have like a methods section. So um, that would be up to the instructor uh, how you know, how they're going to ask you to structure it. When I ask for APA format, I am really focusing on this. I want you to understand the reference style, the in-text citations. Make sure you understand how to paraphrase. You know things like that. So when you go on to the four-year university. You're not blindsided by APA format. What is that? I've never heard of that. Because I guarantee you, your professors will will expect that you understand how to do this. Okay. Does that make sense? But that can be a little bit confusing. When you're writing these up. Any any other questions? So, so um, if you guys will, I have, I have four different handouts up here, and so if you will, come and get a copy of these, and, and they'll all be. I'll hand this out. So, oh, I'll, I'll, you talk. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, so, let me ask you this first, and I'll start this thing as opposed to just kind of, kind of talking. I'll just ask you guys a question. How many of you guys have trouble with formatting papers? Some of you do. Oh, yeah, quite a few of you. Nick's got his hand way, way up. All right. Um, tell me what the problems are that you have. Getting the works cited page right? Yeah. Yeah, that can that can be an ongoing problem for lots and lots of folks. Nick, yours? Works cited page. Uh huh. In text citations. How about you? Worksite page. All right. Anything else? Worksite pages huh? and in-text citations. Yeah, that's a pain. Um, there have been some changes. There have been some changes to MLA formatting. So you guys, I think, I think everyone in here is actually from a 112 class, and so you kind of are, are kind of straddling the changes. So when you took when you took 111, um, we did things a certain way, and now you're taking 112, and there's been changes over the summer, which, which is unfortunate. But that happens occasionally. Um, 
Before we actually get into that, as, as Cynthia talked about, I will talk to you briefly about plagiarism. Okay? So I have I have a sheet for plagiarism. Um, just to kind of clear up misconceptions, ideas, things like that. I have a mock paper in here that I came up with. Um, so a pretend student's copy that kind of shows you proper MLA formatting, all right, with with the changes so far. I've got some stuff that I scavenged from Valencia College, all right, that, that also talks about it and makes clear the changes with that. Um, but before we get into that, before we get into the work scientist stuff and all of that, uh, talking about citation, talking about research and integration and all this stuff, plagiarism. Tell me your perception of plagiarism. What is it? What's that? Copying something that's not yours? Okay. Other ideas of what this is? Lazy. What's that? Lazy. Lazy. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. I, would, I would be inclined to agree. Stealing someone else's ideas. Mm -hmm. Stealing someone else's ideas. Well, not properly documenting what you use somebody else's ideas. Yeah. Yeah, actually a lot of that happens accidentally. You have a lot, you have accidental and when you think about plagiarizing, you think about someone buying a paper offline or something like that and then slapping their name on it, which can happen, but a lot of this actually happens accidentally. So that you guys are writing a paper and because you're unaware of the nuances of citation and, and, and how to document your usage of other people's stuff in your research, you may accidentally commit plagiarism. And so you have this sheet, this avoiding plagiarism sheet, and we'll talk about a few of the points on it. And again, you know, being that, being that you guys have handouts, I don't want you to read you, but we'll, we'll just make it a bit interactive. Um, when do you cite something? When is it, when is it proper to actually cite something? Say Oh yeah, when you're quoting someone, sure, sure. Yeah, you gotta. Yeah, if you're using a direct quote, you definitely gotta. Yeah. When you use the ideas, like when you um, put in your paper, you know, it's outside of Okay. You mean original information? Yeah. Right? Well, well, I mean their ideas. Yeah. So, um, tell me this. Some of the some of the time, students will. And I did this when I was a student. You'll write something, you'll not cite it because you consider it to be fairly common knowledge. When is that okay to do? Because some things are are commonly known. What, what's the cutoff point? What, how do you know whether you need to cite something or not? If you didn't know before you did the research, yeah, that's 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 the common sense answer, right? Um, is there anything else though? If you copy it in like the quote directly. Oh yeah, I mean there's that, there is that. Yeah, but keep going. When, when is it okay not to cite something? How many of you guys know who's running the presidential campaign right now? Does anybody not know the two candidates? <laughs> you know the two candidates, right? Yes. You wouldn't have to cite that. If you wrote a paper and you said that Donald Trump was running against Hillary Clinton, you would not need to cite that. Okay? Why? Because it's common knowledge. Right? It's considered common knowledge. Um, when you start to get into, you're starting to get into the nuances of, of those campaigns. You have, to, you have to look up source material. You have to do research and, and work in percentages and things like this. Then you have to cite. And so <coughs> the idea basically, the rule of thumb is, if it's not something that's, that's broadly known as, as general information, or if you're in doubt, cite it. Right? If you're in doubt, cite it. All right? It's better to have too many of these things, or it's better to, to oversight something than to, than to do this, to commit accidental plagiarism. Um, what about paraphrasing? Take a look at the sheet. The idea of inserting synonyms for author's words. How many of you guys have done this before? Have you done this? You think, I'll make it my own by changing the wording. Have you ever done this? You have done this? 
Ben's done it. I'll just say, God, man, I want to say this. I'll change it again to my own. That doesn't work. Right? Even if you change the wording, you're still using the person's ideas. Okay? And so if you're using synonyms or paraphrasing or whatever, you still got to cite this thing. You still got to cite it. Okay? <coughs> what about? Very brief, very brief usage of, of the author's words. So what if you use maybe three words from the author? Do you have to do you have to cite it? Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, what about if you talk to somebody and you use them as a source? You have to cite that. Yeah. What's that? It wasn't right. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the thing that I'm driving at here, the thing that I'm driving at, and I can see you guys are on the seat, the edge of your seat in anticipation when I'm driving at. Um, anything that you use, it's, it's a broad blanket statement. Anything you use, it's not your own. You got to cite. It, okay. So the biggest thing with plagiarism is accidental plagiarism. Honestly, by far and away. I'm going to say that I've seen lots and lots more of that than I have of people buying papers and writing name on and stuff like that. So I'm not going to go through all the particulars of this thing, but do use it. Okay, it's a good little cheat sheet. <coughs> it's a good, it's a good thing to uh, to refer to when you're actually writing a paper. Um, if you look at this this handout from Valencia College, it's got a few highlights in terms of in terms of changes. From MLA 8, from, well, from 7 to 8. A lot of these actually have to do with the stuff, or actually all of them have to do with the stuff that you guys brought up in terms of what you have problems with. You have trouble with in text citations and the work cited page. And so, just to kind of look at it briefly, the changes. Previously, well, just for fun, let me ask this question. How many of you guys actually have? written a paper in the past two years which you can use to flesh it. A book. An actual book. Four? Awesome. Alright. Four people. If if you're one of the proud few that still use print books, right? Um, if you've gotten used to citing or putting in the city for publication in, in the work site, you no longer do that. Okay? And so at some point, some professor, and if you have me for 112, I'm going to make you use a book source, okay? And so, it's good to look at peer terror. What? Yeah, you'll have to use a book. Um, you don't cite the city anymore. You don't list that. You don't list the medium. So, you got used to... In, in MLA. In MLA, yes, MLA. I'm talking about MLA. Yes, you um, In MLA, you don't list the medium. So, whereas before you got used to on the worksite page, right? print or web or something like that, you no longer do that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> use of abbreviations such as volume or vol for volume, in over number, P or PP for page, page numbers, things like this, you no longer use. Okay. In, in the in-text, I'm sorry, in the works cited page. Most of the time, you don't have date of access for electronic sources. So if you've been used to having a date of access, which you should have been, right? When you access this thing and then the date that it was actually published, you're going to now leave off the date of access and only have the date of publication for web material. Also, noticeable change is that you're going to incorporate the URLs into the works cited page again. Okay, so depending on how long you guys have been writing papers, which probably used to people telling you absolutely don't put the URL into the works cited page. How many of you guys have heard that? Don't do it no matter what, don't do it. Yes? Well, now you do it. <laughs> and why this is, um, the changes and updates in MLA. And you can see this, I have a working copy of this in this mock paper right here. If you turn to the back,
page 8, <coughs> the works cited page, um, you'll see the basic layout of how this is supposed to work. Okay? You'll see the basic work, the layout of this thing. Is he? Oh. Um, and you can see <coughs> the inclusion of the URL. There's been some, some really, really nitpicky changes in that as well. So while you'll have the URL, you won't have the HTTP part of this thing. If it's on there, some professors will count off for that. Um, you'll see other changes, things we've already talked about, the idea of citing the city and things like that. And so this is a good little, this would be sort of serve as a good little guide in terms of how one of these things should now look. How it should now look. Right now. So I'm going to interject here just a little bit. This is where you're going to where things can get confusing. MLA is now requiring URLs. APA is moving away from the URLs. Um, and if you turn to the third page in the APA handout that I gave you, this is the most common way that you would provide a reference on your reference page in APA formatting, where it says citing electronic journals. Now you see that the way that the indentations is done is the same, but what APA is asking for is something that's called a digital object identifier, and they're doing this really specifically to get away from the URLs because URLs change so much that you know how links become dead. Right? So this is what psychology has done to try to get away from this. DOI, or the Digital Object Identifier, is this little tiny number that you'll usually find in the upper right hand corner of the journal article. And it will say, it, it says DOI, and then it's a string of a whole bunch of numbers. And you can usually just copy and paste it in and just make it the correct size, you know, times New Roman 12, so that, it, so that it's... Uh, so I just wanted to mention that because that is very confusing with MLA saying one thing and now APA saying another. Like, uh, what are we supposed to do? Yeah, and also note um, for MLA, for MLA now, um, in-text citations. There have been some changes in that as well. If you look at this, is very very superficial. But if you look at this um, Valencia College handout. Right? Um, <coughs> Actually, skip the page because you guys really need it. Go to the bottom of page three, and then on the top of page four, you can kind of start to see. You can get sort of an easy go-to guide for the most common in-text citations you're likely to use, right? So web-based citations um, with two or three authors, sites with more than three authors, things like this. All right. There have been some superficial changes in that. What I'll not do is to run to the particulars of that. Uh, so we start to talk about it, we get really technical and probably very boring. I'll see you guys blaze over and your mouth start to open, stuff like that. So I'll give that to you as sort of, as sort of a go-to guide. Um, she had mentioned, Cynthia had mentioned the Purdue OWL, which is an invaluable resource for, for MLA as well. Um, you, have, you have the updated versions of of what you what you'll need, right, for for the eighth edition that people will be using now. All right, so do use that. Um, how many guys? Well, I think she asked you this. I'm going to shame you and ask you this again. How many guys routinely use EasyBib or some citation machine? Wait, what yeah, I was going to say. Just admit it. Just go ahead. I know. I know. I did before the new changes. Oh yeah, I did, but I quit. I quit now. What are your thoughts on using it? If you're going to use, I'll say it like this, for MLA, if you're going to use it, um, realistically, as a professor, I should say to you, don't use that, right? And you do it yourself. Uh, do I know that you're going to use it? Yes, I know that you're going to use it, okay? As do most all English professionals. You know that you guys use this. I would not use it for a variety of reasons. Um, the changes haven't been updated yet. So, if you use it, it's going to give you the wrong citations. Um, <clears throat> if you use it, go back and cross-check it with 
with the changes that have been made. And I'll say that probably with the amount of work you would do by entering that into EasyBib and cross-checking it with the new changes and all this stuff, probably it's easier just to just to do it manually. Right? Just good old manual work. Right? But that's a that's a just a note of caution to be careful with EasyBib. What I'll say about entering these manually, and I'll say this having completed a dissertation. <laughs> required. I had I mean, like 30 pages of just references that I entered manually over an extended period of time. I understand that this seems like tedious work. Well, it is tedious work, it doesn't seem to be. Um, but the argument for in entering them manually is they get easier. If you start doing this, if you get used to doing this, MLA, APA, and then, oh, guess what? There's a Chicago, what is it for history? Chicago format. Chicago, Chicago format, right? So you, you, you get to do that for history. You're going to learn at least three forms of, of three styles of format from here. If you do this manually, and this is not, it's not difficult. It really isn't difficult. It's just, it's a little time consuming because you have to change italics and then normal and make sure your commas and your, you know, it's very detail-oriented work. And, but if you have three references or five references, how long is it going to take you to type up three or five references on an in-text, on a works cited or a, a reference page, realistically? You know, how much time is that really going to take you? Versus doing it wrong, or not sure if you've done it wrong because you're relying on some te technology that you don't completely understand what's going in there, and you're going to have to go back and check it in anyway. So it's a good idea when you get when you get to a level where your references are you know, many, 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 many references. There are there is software that's available that can help you organize them and can keep track of them. But at this stage of the game, it's really uh, it's in your best interest to learn how to. Just type them in manually. And something else, um, keep a guide handy. You know what I mean? Keep, keep a guide handy. Whether you're doing, I'm assuming for APA as well, but definitely for MLA, if you're writing a paper, do not go off memory. Okay? Don't do that. Right? For, for how to do a work site. If you've got three or four different, three or four different types of sources, check, check them. Make sure that you're doing them formatting the problem. Memorizing all that stuff, not probably not the best idea. And if you do memorize all that stuff, you're probably gonna you're probably gonna lose some some details that you need, like the way to your house or something like that, right? And so officially. <laughs> so uh, keep keep a guide around. You know what I mean? Keep a guide around to, to cross check your things. I do. I do too. I don't have to memorize that. It's why would I? Yeah, realistically, <laughs> it's, it's not going to happen. So don't go off memory. Oh, I know how to do that. Check. I'm curious. So a few of you raised your hands and said that you were really having difficulties with the um, work cited page or with a reference page. Can anybody expand on that? What what kinds of problems you're having? I know you said that that was a problem, and I think some of you here said they're having problems with that. It's just a lot of tedious. I do like trying to remember the minutia of grammatical syntax in a paper. It is. And so I think Matt's point, I think Mr. Lavert's point is really spot on. Don't try to work from memory. And and uh, and the guides are really thick, so hopefully these cheat sheets are going to be more helpful where you just have a couple of pages. You can look, all right, how do I do a journal article? Does mine look like this? Okay, I, I'm, I'm spot on. Is it not matching? What do I need to change? And that can, you know, that can help, I think, with that. It is that kind of work. I, I, I won't deny it. It is that kind of work. It is, and there's no way around it. You know, it's, it's, it's just a fact of academic life. You know? it's, not, it's not the most exciting topic, right? But, but it's, it's, it's something that you have to do. As you move up in academia, you write more and more papers. You it's always have to research. Yeah. And so, um, it also it matters. How you format this stuff really matters. It counts. It counts as part of your content. It counts on your grade, all this stuff. And if you got in the habit of thinking 
that so long as you have something there on the work page, the reference page, to show to show that you've done research, you have to make sure it's formatted properly. I can remember, um, I'll give you this, this small personal story. I can remember being a student here a long time ago. But I can remember this and just slapping stuff on onto the page. Well, there it is. I did the research and you can see it. And then I can remember getting the paper back and seeing the grade. I think I might have actually held it up to the light <laughs> to see if that was the actual grade. Uh, that stuff counts. That stuff counts. It really does. Uh, so make sure, make sure that you take the time. There's another important point with APA, and I'm going to assume that MLA is the same. If you have an in-text citation, you need a reference. You, you, they need to match, right? Same thing? Absolutely. And right. vice versa. And vice versa. Yeah. Right? So if you have a reference, you need an in-text citation. It, it, you don't want to just have this kind of like blanket thing. Well, all right, well, you looked at Bandura in 1976, but I don't really know where you looked at it. So you need to cite it, and then you need to have your reference. Always have them match. And that's a really good organizational tool to keep in mind. Uh, this is a problem I see with lots of papers where, um, actually this could lead to, I don't know if you find this in MLA, but when you're in how, how, how to create a reference page, you want to use primary source, right? So here is um, here is an article. Now this article may have, or this paper, it's probably a better example, which is, which is Freeman. This paper has how many? Eight, nine references? Do you use any of these for your reference page or your in-text citation? Well, it depends. <laughs> when, when would you, what, what, what's your, what's your primary source here? We do this differently in psychology. I'm confusing it. This is it. All right. If you're taking information from this paper, from Freeman's paper, this is who you cite. If you are interested in what Freeman looked at from mother's eggs could mean daughter, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you need to go to this resource. And then you use this resource. So then you would have both of those as in-text citations and as references. So one of the things that I have seen students do is if they're looking at a journal article which has, you know, like 50 or 60 references and citations, they'll start grabbing some of those and put them in as their references, right? That's what you're saying. Yeah, yeah we don't need to do that. It, it's, it's the same thing. Those are not, you, when you're looking at an article, you are referencing that article. If you want to go to the, to the book or the article that they're referencing, you would have to physically pull that out, read it, and then does that make sense? You see what I'm getting at? I see this as a real point of confusion. You should not have a real long list of references just because the paper that you used, that you referenced, had a long list of references. Having said that, as a point of clarity, anything that you look at, any primary resource, you've got to be listed on that worksite page. So if you use this as a source, that's going to happen. And if you have it on a works cited page, you're going to have to have an textual citation. Um, lots of people will get in the habit of having a works cited page, no textual citations. And so there's no way for a professor to know they actually used that material or if you just listed it in the paper. So, there's no, so you, have to, you have to show the research inside the paper. You've got to have, you've got to have citations in this. That's why it's called a works cited page. Similarly, if you've got something that's, that's cited inside the paper and doesn't show up on the 
the works cited page, that's a problem as well. Okay, so the two have to correspond. I think you guys know that probably. If not, do you have questions? Now you do. Now you know. Now you know. Questions? We have no questions. I'll ask you the same question as Cynthia. With with unknown information, like a lot of the websites, you can't find an author's name. It might just be maybe you're at like CNN.com, so it's CNN staff. We don't have like an author. How would you? The same way, actually. This is one of the very few. You don't just leave it out. You know, you so indicate the missing that's information. Right. Yep. And there there is a there is a specific way. Isn't it italicized? So, like for instance, here on this, this third page in APA, and under Internet Sources, this just gives one example. There's no author, but it says U.S. General Accounting Office, right? So that would be one way that you would, if you went to, a, you know, to Psychology Today or something, if there wasn't, if there isn't an author. Um, Podcasts, YouTube videos. There is a way to to reference almost everything. And for index citations, if we don't have an author's name, I notice it's a shortened version of the title and it's in quotation marks. That's right. That's right. Other questions? Oh, one thing. Sure. On the Valencia handout. Yes. You said that they're not using the abbreviations anymore. Right. Did they? They're not. Yeah. Yep. Not not in the work site. There is the writing center here, this space right here, right? Always here. So, um, have lots of eyes that can uh, help you look at your citations and your reference page and make sure you've got those, you know, nitpicky things down. This was my easy did this year. That's good. Yeah. yeah, okay. That's <laughs> yeah. point. Well, thank you guys for coming. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you guys.